الحمد لله رب العالمين اللهم صل على محمد وعلى اله وصحبه وسلم one of the ways that we can test the truthfulness or the veracity of any message or any claim to revelation is by examining the life and the behavior of the person who claims to carry the message in this case of course we're going to look at the life of the prophet muhammad may god's peace and blessings be upon him and we are going to look at the life of the prophet muhammad in an analytical sense in a rational way we want to ask ourselves uh, or pose three simple questions or three variant possibilities the first possibility is that the prophet muhammad or that any person in fact who claims to be a prophet who claims to be receiving revelation from god we can apply these possibilities to that individual or in fact in fact any individual who's making a claim about anything the first possibility is that that individual is a liar that individual knows that they are not receiving revelation from god and they purposefully go out to deceive people concerning this issue now obviously such a character such a personality would display various characteristics and that there are certain things that would necessitate the effectiveness of such a deception we'll examine those issues just in a minute the second possibility is that the individual is not a liar the individual sincerely and truly believes that they are receiving revelation from god but they are deluded they are perhaps suffering from some type of psychotic mental condition uh perhaps they are suffering some form of delusion but the person sincerely and truly believes that they are a messenger from god they are not lying they are not deceiving they actually truly believe it and such an individual will also display certain characteristics certain attributes certain ways of behaving and the third possibility is of course that that individual is telling the truth that individual actually is indeed receiving revelation from god what we want to do is apply this analytical approach to the prophet muhammad and we don't have time to examine in depth and in detail the whole life and the character of the prophet muhammad so what we want to do today very briefly is begin by discussing what the opponents of islam have said in their arguments about the prophet muhammad now being opponents of islam of course they are not prepared to accept the third alternative that muhammad may god's peace and blessings be upon him was a prophet so they have to find some other explanation they have to come to some other conclusion as to why islam is the way it is how did the information in the quran come to be the way it is how do we explain the behavior and the life and the teachings of prophet muhammad and the whole of islam since they can't accept that he is a prophet of god they must find an alternative alternative explanation now one of the uh, oldest polemicists against islam was a man called john of damascus john of damascus was a monk who wrote some of the first actual written attacks against the prophet muhammad of course in the life of prophet muhammad he suffered many attacks and many insults and many abuses by the quraysh but this was the first constructed attack against the prophet muhammad uh, and even these writings exist today and john of damascus posited the argument that muhammad had invented islam he was a liar the whole thing was contrived the whole thing was invented and in order to explain the information in the quran john of damascus said that the prophet muhammad learned it from a nestorian priest a nestorian priest the nestorians are a sect of christianity and he claimed that all of this information was learned from a nestorian priest and others have uh, proposed the same type of idea that he had someone 
from whom he was gathering all of this information, maybe some priests, maybe some rabbis, uh, but anyway, this information must have come from some human source, someone who was well versed, someone who was knowledgeable in religious affairs, in legal affairs, and so on and so forth, who is feeding Muhammad this information. And that Muhammad invented this whole religion for his own personal gain. So this is one proposition. Now, some modern writers have taken that same approach, but they have tried to give the cloud, as we could say, a silver lining. They said, yes, Muhammad invented Islam, but his intentions were good. He invented it because he found his people in such a bad condition that he, he wanted to improve their condition, and he decided that monotheism and removing them from idolatry was the best path to their reformation. But it still leaves the question, from where did Muhammad get this information from that we find contained in the Qur'an and in the teachings of the Prophet Muhammad? It still leaves us with the position that he must have lied, he must have invented it, he must have got that information from somewhere. So this is one uh, particular group of uh, writers have gone down this line. Uh, and they obviously will not accept that the Prophet Muhammad is a messenger from God. The other group has taken a different approach. They examined the life of Prophet Muhammad and they said that, well, everything we can see about this man from his character, from his personality, from the way that he behaved, from his personal characteristics that he displayed to his wives, to his companions, and so on and so forth, shows that this man genuinely believed that he was a messenger of God because he did not behave in the manner and with the characteristics of a liar. In fact, as we have previously mentioned, he was known amongst his people for his truthfulness, his trustworthiness and his honesty. One of the nicknames that the pagan Arabs had given to Prophet Muhammad before he claimed prophethood was Al-Amin, and Al-Amin means in Arabic the truthful and the trustworthy. He was well known amongst them for his honesty, his truthfulness in his dealings, and his sincerity. And this, these characteristics, the Prophet Muhammad continued to display throughout all of his life. And so they said, well, the Prophet Muhammad manifested this apparent and obvious sincerity and truthfulness. We don't find duplicity in his character. We don't find deceitfulness in his character. So they said, no, we cannot accept that the Prophet Muhammad was a liar. Therefore, we believe that he was deluded. He was suffering from some psychotic condition, uh, some form of epilepsy, some neurosis that made him believe that he was a prophet but he was a very sincere individual, although concerning the issue of being a prophet of God, of course, we don't accept that. This is what they claim. Therefore, they explain the life of Prophet Muhammad, and they explain him by saying that he was suffering some type of delusion. Now, what is interesting is when we bring both of these two ways of describing or explanation for the life of Prophet Muhammad together. When we bring them together, we are, we are left with a problem. And the problem is this, is these two different ways of examining the life of Prophet Muhammad actually contradict each other. The first one says that we need to explain the information in the Qur'an. We need to explain its deep knowledge of theology, of philosophy, of law, of religion, of history, of science, and all of these things are manifest and clear in the Qur'an. Where did this knowledge and information come from? These people say, well, it must have, the Prophet Muhammad must have learnt it from someone. But the other is that the Prophet Muhammad was honest and truthful and trustworthy. So on one hand, we need or the people who are trying to attack the Prophet Muhammad and say that he's not a prophet, they need on one hand to say he was a liar, and they need to say that to explain the information in the Qur'an. On the other hand, they need to say that he was deluded, because that's the only way that they can explain his truthfulness and his sincerity. 
But of course, somebody can't be a liar and be deluded both at the same time. You can't be a liar and be deluded both at the same time. You can only have one or the other. But they need both in order to completely and properly explain the life of Prophet Muhammad. Let's further explain that. If you are deluded and you think that you're, you are a messenger of God, when someone asks you a question or where you, when you are confronted with a problem, you don't think, oh, let me run off and ask my source of information, my rabbi or my priest who's teaching me things, because you don't need to, because you think God is going to reveal that to you. So a deluded person does not go off seeking information from someone or somewhere because that person believes that God is going to reveal that information to them. This is how a person who is deluded into thinking they are receiving revelation behaves. So we see the impossibility of having both things at the same time. Of course, a simple way to reconcile these conflicting opinions is that the information in the Qur'an concerning theology and philosophy and history and science and so on and so forth is there because this knowledge has come from God and the sincerity and the truthfulness of the Prophet Muhammad is there because he was exactly what he claimed to be a messenger of God and in fact this is the sincere and honest way to reconcile these two things to come to the rational conclusion that the Prophet Muhammad must be what he claimed to be a messenger of God. Now, I just want to use three incidents from the life of the Prophet Muhammad. There are so many that we could use and so many things that we could uh, illustrate our examples with from the life of Prophet Muhammad. In fact, I do encourage everybody to get hold of a good, authentic life history of the Prophet Muhammad written by a Muslim and read it for yourself and I am sure that if you are sincere and you are honest to yourself that you'll be convinced that this man is a messenger of God but I want to take only a few examples the first example I want to take is in the early days of Islam when the Prophet Muhammad had begun preaching his message and the pagan Arabs the leaders of pagan Arabian society began to realize that the message of Islam was not going to go away. In fact, more and more people were becoming Muslim. And many of them were slaves and women, the most downtrodden and exploited people in society. And they began to see that Islam had the potential to upset their whole social structure and their status quo and their control over society. So they came with a proposition to the Prophet Muhammad. This is the leaders of the pagan Arabs. They said, look, if you want to be our king if what you desire by calling people to this religion is to be our king we will make you our king if what you desire is money then we will make you the richest man amongst us if you desire women name whatever women that you wish and we will take the most beautiful women of Quraysh and marry them to you and if you are suffering from some illness or from some disease that you say the spirit comes and talks to you, we will spend any amount of money and do whatever we can until you are cured from this illness. So if we really think about this offer that was made by the pagan Arabs to Prophet Muhammad, every possible worldly motivation is there. Do you want to be the king? In other words, if the Prophet Muhammad is seeking to be a ruler and to be king, they'll say, we'll make you our king. You want to be rich? If that's your motivation, we'll give you money. You want women? We'll give you whatever women you like. You have some problem, you have some disease, we will spend whatever it takes until it is cured. What is there? What worldly offer is not contained in this offer? It's all there. If the Prophet Muhammad was motivated by any worldly needs or by any worldly desire, he could have accepted their offer and it would have been satisfied. So what was his reply? His reply to his uncle is famous. In one of the books of Sirah it is mentioned that, oh my uncle, if you give me the sun in one hand and the moon in the other, 
I will never leave off calling to this message. Or in another time he said to his uncle that I cannot abandon calling to this religion and to this message any more than you could take a torch and light it from the sun. So clearly, the Prophet Muhammad was not motivated by worldly desires. And we have to again pose the question, is this the manner of a liar? Is this the manner of a deluded person? Then another amazing incident that we want to narrate is when the Prophet Muhammad first publicly called people to Islam. A truly remarkable thing happened. He stood on the top of a mount uh, of a particular hill in Mecca called Mount Safa. And traditionally, this was a place where if Mecca was being attacked, someone would go and stand on the top of this hill and shout a warning to the people that the city was being attacked. So the Prophet Muhammad went to the top of this mountain and started shouting and calling the people. So the people came and all of the tribes, everybody came and if uh, the leader of the tribe did not come, they sent a representative. And so when the people were gathered in front of him, the Prophet Muhammad started calling the various tribes of Mecca uh, by name. Oh, tribe of such and such, oh, tribe of this and that, calling the different tribes. And then he said, I have come to warn you of a terrible punishment from your Lord. I have come to warn you of a terrible punishment from your Lord. When one of the uncles of Prophet Muhammad heard this, his name was Abu Lahab, he started insulting the Prophet. He started cursing the Prophet Muhammad. May your face be rubbed in the dust. Is this what you wasted our time for, Muhammad? For this? You wasted our time for this? We could have been earning money in the marketplace and you wasted our time for this? And this is when some verses of the Qur'an were revealed. These verses of the Qur'an are very well there. It's one of the short chapters at the end of the Qur'an. But very briefly, that's not the whole chapter, but what the meaning of this chapter is, is that this small verse of the Qur'an is saying that you, Abu Lahab, and your wife, you are going to be in the hellfire because of your persistent disbelief. Now, Abu Lahab was a character that whatever the Prophet Muhammad said, this man would contradict it. In fact, when the Prophet Muhammad used to go and try and teach the people and talk to them about Islam, Abu Lahab would follow behind him and then he would warn the people and say, this man is a liar, this man is trying to misguide you, don't listen to him, will you abandon the religion of your ancestors, and so on and so forth. So every time the Prophet was trying to call the people to the beauty of the worship of the one God, to this true religion, this man would contradict him. But all this man, Abu Lahab, ever needed to do to almost demolish Islam was to testify that there is only one God, Allah, and that Muhammad was the messenger. And then he could say, well, I'm a Muslim now, but what are you going to do with this verse of Quran that says that I'm going to be in the hellfire and that I will die a disbeliever? But for 10 years, these verses of the Quran and this Abu Lahab existed side by side. But he could never take this testimony of faith. Would a liar behave like that? Would someone who is inventing something begin with such a dangerous challenge? People who are lying and people who are deceivers, they're usually very careful and manipulative in the way in which they deal with things. But these verses of the Qur'an show the complete honesty and the complete sincerity and the forthrightness of this message of Islam. Believe in Allah and his messenger or you will face a terrible punishment from Allah. And when this man Abu Lahab protests and he starts insulting, then these verses come from God to the Prophet Muhammad. You are going to suffer eternally for your disbelief. This is not a very, uh, if you were a conniving person, lying and deceiving, I don't think this is the way that you would think of starting your message because then the man would say, but, but actually I was really thinking about becoming Muslim and, and I wanted to embrace Islam. And you would re look really a fool. So we see that, and this is what we mean, is that when you're looking at the life and the teachings of the Prophet Muhammad, 
You do not find the characteristics of a deceiver and of a liar. Yet when we go and we examine the Qur'an, we find all this knowledge, all this information, that even some of these things scientists have only begun to discover today is truly remarkable. Now there's one final incident I want to mention uh, that is really, again, a very strong and very clear uh, illustration uh, that the Prophet Muhammad must have been a messenger from God. And this is uh, some later time in, in uh, Medina. Uh, the Prophet Muhammad had, uh, had a son. Uh, the son, his name was Ibrahim. Uh, and the Prophet Muhammad, of course, may God's peace and blessings be upon him. You know, he longed for a son and he had this beautiful son. His name was Ibrahim. But when Ibrahim was six months old, just six months old, this baby died actually in the arms of the Prophet Muhammad. Now, on the very same day which the son, the child of the Prophet Muhammad had died, there was an eclipse of the sun. So imagine that. The Prophet Muhammad's son dies, and the very same day there is an eclipse of the sun. And I'm sure there's many people, even uh, right now, who would say, that's it for me. If there was an eclipse of the sun on the same day that his son died, he must be a prophet of God. You would think of it that it's a type of proof. And in fact, in those days, when people were very superstitious, they started running out of the buildings. They, they had heard that the Prophet Muhammad's son had died, and now they were seeing an eclipse of the sun, and they started coming out of their houses saying, look, even the sun darkens for the death of the child of Prophet Muhammad. So this is what the people were saying. Now imagine, if you had been spending so many years lying to people, trying to fool them about this thing, you would say, you see, I told you, the thing I've been telling you all along, you see, this is a proof from God. And if you are deluded, you would be thinking, yes, this is a sign from God to show that I'm a messenger. But what did Prophet Muhammad do? He called the people and he said to them, and when he called them, he assembled them in front of them. He said, this is just the sun and the moon. And they are from the natural ayat of God, the natural processes that God has made. And the sun and moon does not eclipse or rise or set for the death or the birth of any man. So when you see this, pray to your Lord. Is this the words of a deluded person? Are these the words of a liar? No. These are the words of a man who was exactly and truly what he claimed to be, the last and final messenger of God, who has brought the guidance for the peace and the benefits of all humanity until the day of judgment. And this is what we invite you to, based upon your reason and your understanding, that you can think and examine and look, read the Qur'an, study the life of the Prophet Muhammad, be sincere and be honest, and we feel sure that you will be convinced that there is indeed nothing worthy of worship except the one God, the Creator, Allah, and that Muhammad, may Allah's peace and blessings be upon him, is the last and final messenger from Allah. May God's peace and blessings be upon you all, and may God guide all of us closer to the truth. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.